Hi everyone, we're going to take a couple of minutes uh, to let some other people um, join in, so hold tight and uh, we'll get started right away. Hello everyone, why don't we get started. Uh, this is the second in a three-part series on the slants case that we've been uh, putting together here. And specifically what we're, uh, you know, we're gonna look at <clears throat> what we're seeing right now in the aftermath of slants from a legal standpoint. My name is Fyla Shaw and I'm the founder of Aptitex. Aptitex is a full service brand protection company and a corporate domain registrar. And I am pleased today to um, welcome someone who is well known in the trademark industry and our good friend Ann Gilson Lalonde, uh, who's going to be speaking today about um, the aftermath of the of Slant's case. Ann is the author of Gilson on Trademarks, a multi volume treatise on United States trademark law published by Lexis and updated three times a year. She's been working on the treatise in various capacities for over 18 years and took over full authorship from her, her father in January 2006. But before we get started, a couple of quick administrative items. We will take questions at the end of the presentation. So if you have a question, uh, please put it in the chat box and if time permits, we will definitely get to it. Also, if you would like to reach out to Anne directly after the presentation, if you have some questions, additional questions that come up later, we'll put up her contact information on a slide at the very end. I think that's it. So let me now hand it over to Ann. Ann? Terrific. Yes, terrific. Thank you, Faisal. Thank you all for tuning in today. We're going to be talking first about the Mattel v. Tam case, how it got to the Supreme Court and what the court held. Then I'll describe the current status of disparaging trademarks, including the Redskins case, um, the USPTO's policy on disparaging marks, and what kinds of applications have been coming in. I know people are worried about, about that issue. I'll also talk about some challenges that might prevent these applications from becoming registrations and speculate just a little bit on what Congress might do with the part of the Lanham Act that has been found unconstitutional. And then I'll move on to scandalous marks and the possible future of the ban on registering those marks along with talking about what the PTO has found to be scandalous in the past, and then conclude with a discussion of dilution by tarnishment and how the Mattel case might affect that cause of action. So I just want to note at this point, I don't think it's really possible to have a genuine discussion of this topic without talking about the actual trademarks or putting them on the screen. It's important to be specific about language in this context. So if I say a lot of people are trying to register the N-word, what does that mean? Is it literally the phrase the N-word? So maybe, maybe not. So I'm not going to avoid the words that are involved in these marks, whether they're in the disparaging category or the scandalous category. So I hope people aren't offended, but I, I just don't think there's any um, good way to go about understanding this topic. So with that, um, let's get into the substance. Section 2A of the Lanham Act says that the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office has to refuse registration to marks that consist of or comprise immoral or scandalous matter or matter which may disparage persons living or dead, institutions, beliefs, or national symbols. And I know the word immoral is in there, but the PTO and the courts have never explicitly relied on that concept or really interpreted it. So I'm not going to use it. I think 
even more so than scandalous. I, I think it's just clearly too vague as a principled ground for rejecting applications. So the PTO has just, just never relied on it. Many of you, I'm sure, know the background of the TAM case. I'm just going to give a brief summary. Simon Tam applied to the USPTO to register the slants for a live performances by a musical band. The registration was refused under Section 2A on the ground that the term slants was disparaging of Asian Americans. And as you can see from these specimens, the band had been using Asian indicia in its advertising. So the PTO believed it was justified in making that connection and assuming the consumers were going to make that same connection. And I note here along the bottom, these are Tam's original specimens. So he actually abandoned this first application and reapplied after the first refusal. So the second time Tam applied, he used different specimens. And you can see these don't have any Asian indicia. It's not at all dishonest. He was just trying to change the context in which the PTO was looking at his mark. But the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board said, we're not limited to the four corners of the application. We look at how the applicant actually uses the mark. And in fact, it uses Asian indicia. So the board found that the mark as used was disparaging to a substantial component of the reference group. That's the test. And it affirmed the refusal. And I actually think it ended up as a good thing that the PTO looked at the context because it really focused the issue of disparagement in the case. So on its first pass at TAM's appeal, the Federal Circuit affirmed the refusal. It said the mark was disparaging in context. TAM also argued that the court, which he, he couldn't do before the board because the board can only rule on registrability, that the restriction on disparaging marks was unconstitutional, violated the First Amendment. The Federal Circuit found that it was bound by precedent to reject that argument. It had ruled in 1991, there's no First Amendment problem with the restriction on registration. It didn't suppress any speech because the applicants were free to use their trademarks no matter what. But in a very unusual move, Judge Moore of the panel wrote several pages of additional views saying that it was high time that the Federal Circuit rethought the First Amendment issue. So this separate opinion, essay, something, I don't know what it was, it laid out the case for finding that the disparagement provision was unconstitutional. In 1995, before she was a judge, Judge Moore had written a law review article on exactly this topic focused on the Washington Redskins trademarks and arguing that Section 2A was unconstitutional. So she was fully prepared for this case. A week later, the Federal Circuit vacated the panel opinion and the order said that the Federal Circuit judges voted in a poll and supported sua sponte on banc consideration. A few months later, the Federal Circuit reversed the TTAB in an en banc opinion, which was of course written by Judge Moore, and it ruled that the prohibition against registering disparaging marks was unconstitutional as a restriction on speech. And then we all know the issue went to the Supreme Court. So on June 19th, the Supreme Court agreed, holding that the disparagement provision violated the free speech clause. This slide for me really sets the tone for the Supreme Court opinion. So not only there are opinions by different sets of justices, but the whole thing is really not a model of clarity. All eight justices who decided the case joined a section that turned out to be the majority opinion. Justice Gorsuch had just been sworn in, so he didn't participate. But right here, this is how the majority sums up the holding of the court. The provision offends a bedrock First Amendment principle speech may not be banned on the ground that it expresses ideas that offend. So here's what we know from the majority. First, while it's true trademark owners can use their marks without registering them, it's clear that federal registration is valuable. There are benefits that trademark owners just don't get if they can't put their marks on the federal register. The Supreme Court said this in the B&B hardware case from a couple years ago. That's the preclusion case. So we know that a refusal to register does actually burden speech. 
And second, the court held that the speech at issue here isn't government speech. And that's important because the First Amendment doesn't apply to government speech like it does to private speech. The government can have an agenda and it can express some viewpoints at the expense of, of other viewpoints. It can pick and choose in a way that it isn't allowed to do when it's regulating private speech. The court held that the content of registered trademarks isn't govern, government speech, but it, this is the kind of sloppiness that really makes trademark lawyers crazy, especially reading um, uh, articles published on the internet. The court talks about the trademark and the registration process as if they're interchangeable, um, which is really a shame. But it, it, I think it's more obvious that trademarks themselves are not government speech. The court said people don't think the government is saying just do it or have it your way. But the more interesting question was whether issuing a certificate or including a mark in a database is government speech. And to that point, the court said, no, registration doesn't constitute approval of a mark. It's not like mottos on state license plates, which the court did find what recently was government speech. It said that that was the state's approving of those mottos. So the majority gets rid of a couple of barriers to finding the provision unconstitutional. So next is the plurality opinion joined by four justices. This opinion really focused on viewpoint discrimination. It said that giving offense is a viewpoint and the disparagement clause discriminated on the basis of viewpoint when it denied registration to any mark that is offensive to a substantial percentage of the members of any group. That opinion went on to ask, so then what level of scrutiny do we apply to this restriction on speech? The government argued that trademarks are commercial speech, in which case restrictions on them would be subject to a more reduced First Amendment scrutiny. In other words, it's easier for the government to restrict commercial speech in a way that's consistent with the Constitution. Tam argued that, no, trademarks are expressive speech, like his trademark, the slants, that relates to a social issue. And restrictions on expressive speech are much harder to accomplish consistent with the First Amendment. So that would require strict scrutiny. The plurality said, we don't have to decide this issue. The disparagement provision can't even withstand that lesser scrutiny. So the restriction wasn't narrowly drawn to serve a substantial interest. What is the government interest in refusing to register disparaging marks? Well, it, it certainly can influence behavior by, by this refusal. So it might be able to influence the market. The fact that a certain kind of trademark can't be registered is probably going to keep some businesses from adopting those marks in the first place. It, it doesn't seem unreasonable, I think, to suggest that the government has an interest in preventing demeaning speech that hurts minority groups. I'm not sure about this the orderly flow of commerce argument. I don't really know how the presence of unpleasant speech or hate speech even is going to throw commerce into disarray. But the provision has to be narrowly drawn to serve those interests. And it wasn't. The clause, as it's written, we know it includes discriminatory speech. It covers discriminatory speech. But it also includes speech that's going to protest discrimination. So down with racists is also technically disparaging, even though refusing to register that isn't going to serve the government's interests. Justice Kennedy's concurrence, he's joined by three other justices, also decided that Section 2A was viewpoint discrimination. That's really the overall emphasis of each of the opinions in Mittal, that the clause lets the government punish speech because it disapproves of the ideas the speech expresses. Um, and maybe I've been thinking about this a little too much. Maybe everybody else has already realized this. But I just think it's, it's very ironic that the mark that started this whole case is the slants, which really is, means viewpoints. Um, 
So that's, again, that's the theme of the, of the Mattel case, I think. So the PTO, when it's deciding whether to register marks that are disparaging, it had no problem registering positive trademarks or neutral trademarks, but it wouldn't register trademarks that expressed a negative point of view. So the government was picking and choosing and just restricting a subset of messages that it found to be offensive. And the concurrence said, this is viewpoint discrimination and it's censorship. The SLANS application was finally, after many years, published for opposition last week, August 30th. So hopefully that's a happy ending for them and, and their trademark story. What has been the impact on disparaging marks from the Supreme Court's decision? Well, on one hand, the court's decision had no impact at all on the use of disparaging marks. The slants could always perform and sell music under that name. All the other applicants who had been denied registration because their trademarks were found to be disparaging, they could keep selling goods under those brands. So in one way, the court's decision didn't change anything, but the decision did change registration. Which brings me to the other big disparagement case besides the slants. Native Americans have been challenging registrations of the Washington Redskins football team for years. The first cancellation petition was filed in 1992, um, and the board eventually found the marks disparaging, and the U.S. District Court of the Eastern District of Virginia had ordered six of the registrations to be canceled. That court also found that the disparagement bar was constitutional, that it didn't violate the First Amendment. So pro football appealed this cancellation order, but then the TAM case came up and the Fourth Circuit put the case in abeyance pending the Supreme Court's decision. After Matal, the attorneys for the parties agreed that the case was over and the plaintiffs consented to the entry of an order that would vacate the district court order directing cancellation and would remand the case to grant summary judgment to pro football. Um, as of this morning, the Fourth Circuit still hasn't acted to formally dismiss the case, but I have to assume that it's going to do what the parties request here. The PTO had been suspending applications that contained disparaging marks, wasn't rejecting them, it was just suspending them, um, waiting for the Supreme Court's ruling. So now it's finally officially told its examining attorneys that disparagement is no longer a valid ground on which to refuse registration or cancel a registration. So it's going to remove the suspensions on applications that were suspended for disparagement and then go on to examine them for whatever other grounds might be relevant. So has there been a deluge of disparaging mark applications at the USPTO after Mattel? No, I think definitely not. But after the next few slides, after this one, I think many of us might be wishing for the good old days where there were marks like these that were being rejected for registration as disparaging. Buddha beachwear, not the word mark, but the design, disparaged Buddhists. Porno Jesus disparaged Christians. The Federal Circuit even agreed that stop the Islamization of America was disparaging to Muslims and, of course, Sex Rod disparaged the Boston Red Sox. All right, here we go. The application for N-Word was filed just before the Supreme Court opinion in Mattel. It was filed for apparel, including, really oddly in my opinion, triathlon tights. But it was published for opposition just yesterday. Um, the PTO didn't find that term to be disparaging, unlike these others, which would absolutely have been rejected before Mattel. But you see, these other applications are not for the sanitized mark, the N-word. The second one here, Young Nigga World, that's the only use-based filing on this list. I actually looked it up on the, the Google brand search engine, and I got no hits. That doesn't necessarily mean it's not really in use. Um, I checked on the specimen on the PTO webpage, and it's very odd. It's about a three or four second audio file that's almost entirely garbled. 
So this is going to be an interesting application to follow. The third one, nigger please, it was filed the same day the Mattal opinion came down. And I, I point this one out because this is the only application that includes the word nigger and not a derivation. So I, I'm hoping that that's a good sign that only one applicant was willing to go that far in the application. These next two have been filed before Mattal as intent to use applications. They were suspended. So I assume that the PTO will revive them, but it probably will suspend the one that includes the word shit for being scandalous. So they're going to have to wait. Um, then then the two at the end both intend to use for shirts. Just a few more applications for this term. At the top, there are three intent to use applications by one applicant for NIGA. And that same applicant also applied to register a swastika after Mattal. Um, then there's another ITU application for online retail store services. And finally, there are three ITU applications from the same owner for the word mark and the logo you see here in the corner for a, a laundry list of what appear to be totally random goods and services. This is just a very small sample. So it includes decorative charms for pet collars, plush toys, charitable fundraising, eggnog, and inevitably shirts. That is it for maybe the most disparaging term. These aren't examples of the current applications for this term. They are it, this slide and the one before it. So definitely not a huge number contrary to what I think a lot of people were worried about. Dykes on Bikes, the word mark was already registered in 2007, but when the applicant applied for this logo a couple of years ago, the USPTO refused registration on the ground of disparagement. The examining attorney said, I'm not bound by the actions of past examining attorneys and prior registrations, even if the registrations have some characteristics similar to the application at issue. The application is still suspended, but presumably the PTO is going to remove it from suspension. Um, but this is a great example of the inconsistency at the USPTO when it was charged with deciding what was disparaging and what wasn't. The first two applications on the slide were filed after the Mattal opinion, and the second two were filed previously and suspended by the USPTO. And these are all intent to use applications. This list is really just to emphasize the line drawing that the USPTO had been going through to decide what was disparaging. These are all current registered marks or they're terms that appear in currently registered marks. I think none of these is as shocking as the ones in the previous slides, but they're still technically at least disparaging of one group or another. Let's talk about a few possible bases for challenging these disparaging mark applications after Mattal, or they could be grounds for refusal by the PTO. You saw that almost all of the disparaging mark applications were intent to use. And a lot of these are going to turn out to be like those applicants who want to put memes or slogans on t-shirts, like alternative facts or nasty woman or the presidential Twitter typo, Kavifi. Not sure how to pronounce it, but that's my attempt. Um, and also just for comparison with the handful of the NIGA applications that we saw, right now there are 36 active applications that include Kavifi. Um, these are generally filed by people who are not entirely clear on the concept of trademark use or trademark registration. So the first ground that's likely to stymie a lot of these applicants is lack of a bona fide intent to use the mark. And that intent has to have existed as of the filing date of the application. I mean, some of these were filed the day that Mattal was, was issued from the Supreme Court. Are there actual plans to use the, these products in commerce? Is there a business plan or are there any other documents? Um, the applicant for NIGA and NIGA brand, 
who says he intends to use the marks on charms for pet collars and eggnog and charitable fundraising and a hundred other goods or services, he's either a very, very busy guy or he's just probably going to be out of luck in getting a registration for, for almost all of these goods. Next, is a term actually used as a trademark? Are consumers going to see it as an indication of source or just as communicating something else, like coolness or political affiliation or support for a certain social cause? So that kind of material is generally found to be ornamental or merely informational and fails to function as a trademark, like Boston Strong or One Nation Under God or Once a Marine, Always a Marine or I Heart DC. These have all been rejected by the USPTO as not functioning as trademarks when they're just put on a shirt or a cause bracelet. Um, the PTO has just put out an examination guide for its examining attorneys on this topic this, this past July that is really worth taking a look at. If you type in exam guide in the search box at the PTO uh, website, you should be able to find it. It's on merely informational matter and it goes into a lot of detail about the PTO's policy on material that fails to function as a mark because it's just informational. There are plenty of examples. It says there that a widely used message or expression that consumers are accustomed to seeing used in everyday speech by a variety of sources is merely informational. So likelihood of confusion. In theory, if a mark is disparaging of a business and kind of evokes the name of a business, the business owner might be able to argue that its customers would be likely to be confused as to source. So this disparaging mark should be enjoined. A couple of decades ago, courts tended to really fudge the law and find that there was confusion just to stop the use of a trademark that they thought was inappropriate. They saw a harm and really just pretended, I think, that consumers might be confused. But that's happening a lot less today. So, for example, the USPTO found consumers weren't likely to think the Red Sox sponsored or endorsed products that were labeled sex rod. It's a lot like gripe sites, the websites that collect complaints about a business like starbucksucks.com or I hate amazon.com or walmart.sucks. These domain names are disparaging of those trademarks, but it's really difficult to argue that consumers genuinely think these sites are associated with the trademark owner, that Walmart is the source of Walmart.sucks or sponsors or approves of it. So a likelihood of confusion claim isn't likely to succeed. And finally, tarnishment is when a mark damages the reputation of a famous trademark. But we're going to talk about the fate of tarnishment uh, more specifically at the end of the webinar. I was curious about this. After Mattal, does Congress have to amend the Lanham Act now that part of the law has been found unconstitutional? So I just did a little poking around. I found what seems to be a somewhat analogous case. Congress passed the Communications Decency Act in February of 1996. It seems very naive, I think, at this point. But um, part of the act was meant to protect minors from offensive communications on the internet. And you can see here one section made it a crime to use the internet to display to anyone under 18 anything that in context depicts or describes in terms patently offensive as measured by contemporary community standards, sexual or excretory activities or organs. About a year later, the Supreme Court found that the provision violated the First Amendment. Much like in Mattal, it said, the fact that society may find speech offensive is not a sufficient reason for suppressing it. So Congress amended the statute a little more than a year after the Supreme Court opinion. And it struck out the language about being patently offensive and community standards and changed it to prohibiting communications that were obscene or constituted child pornography. 
Congress might want to wait until the law on scandalousness is settled, which we'll start with the next slide, but I think it could change the statute, um, change Section 2A of the Lanham Act to bar registration of obscene trademarks instead of disparaging. Rather than just taking the morality provisions out entirely, I think this would probably be more politically palatable and, and also have the virtue of being constitutional at the same time. So what is the status of scandalous trademarks? The scandalousness bar and the disparagement bar, they're usually thought of in tandem because just as a pair, but the Supreme Court opinion was just about disparagement. The PTO has told its examining attorneys to suspend applications that consist of scandalous trademarks, just what it did with disparaging marks. And it says it's going to revisit that directive after Brunetti. So what is Brunetti? Eric Brunetti applied to register the word mark fucked for athletic apparel and also sort of unfortunately children's and infants apparel. And this is one of his specimens. The mark has actually been in use by Brunetti for over 20 years. The TTAB opinion on this, uh, on this mark says, Brunetti has been a trailblazer since the early 90s in popularizing streetwear, having revolutionary themes, proudly subversive graphics, and in-your-face imagery. But the examining attorney refused registration on the ground of scandalousness. And to no one's surprise, the TTAB affirmed. The board found that consumers would see this mark as the same as F-U-C-K-E-D, and that fucked was a vulgar term, and so it was scandalous and unregisterable. Brunetti appealed to the Federal Circuit, but before it could rule, another panel issued its ruling in the TAM case. So the Brunetti panel waited for the Supreme Court to hear the disparagement case. After Mattal, the Federal Circuit went to the parties in Brunetti for additional briefing and asked, is there any basis really for treating scandalousness mar scandalous marks differently than disparaging marks? Whether the Supreme Court's holding that offensive trademarks can't be banned wouldn't just apply to scandalous marks as well. The lawyers for the PTO submitted a brief that said, scandalous marks are different and can still be prohibited from the register. I think that surprised a lot of people who had assumed that if one of these provisions went down, so would the other, but that is not the government's position in this case. The Federal Circuit panel in Brunetti held oral argument on August 29th, so really just a week ago, on the First Amendment question in particular. Um, and fun fact, the panel includes First Amendment and disparagement expert Judge Moore yet again. So you just have to wonder, are the panels really selected at random? I don't know. Um, the panel gave the government lawyer a very hard time during oral argument to the point of just a flat out mocking some of the statements that he made. Um, the Federal Circuit has it, it's, uh, you can locate it on the Federal Circuit website, the audio of the argument. Uh, and this is probably not a good sign for the government's side. So I think this is what the, the main point of the Mattel case that's relevant here. The Supreme Court found giving offense is a viewpoint. And to stop speech just because it gives offense is viewpoint discrimination. But the USPTO argued in Brunetti that barring scandalous marks is not viewpoint discrimination. The, gov the attorney there said refusing to register lewd and profane and vulgar material, that's not suppressing an unpopular point of view. That's viewpoint neutral. And then one of the judges asked, well, what if the mark is America is fucked? What if there's a specific political viewpoint being expressed? How do you draw the line? Um, the government didn't really have an answer for that. Um, but 
even going back to the original mark, I think the PTO position does have a problem. Yes, it's strange to think of marks like fucked as having a viewpoint, but the way I read the concept of viewpoint discrimination here that I think the only way that can make sense in the Mattel opinion the way they use it it's not just viewpoint in the sense of giving a specific opinion about something but it's also in the sense of communicating a message or expressing a sentiment or trying to evoke some kind of emotion and that's how the Supreme Court seems to be using the phrase so in that way, scandalous trademarks are certainly often expressing viewpoints. An oral argument in the, the Brunetti panel, the judges spent most of the time trying to get the government attorney to articulate what the government's interest was in the scandalousness ban. And the PTO attorney said the government wanted to promote the use of non-scandalous trademarks in commerce, which really seems to be kind of an unhelpful tautology. Um, so they kept pressing him, and finally he added that, well, the government wants to promote commerce that doesn't include graphic sexual images or profanity that would be off-putting to a substantial portion of the public. Um, and I think the graphic sexual images part, I mean, that would be you know, covered by obscenity law. I don't think that, that um, the PTO, even with the disparagement clause gone, that the PTO would have to register truly obscene images. Um, but so even if this is, a, let's say, a substantial and legitimate government interest, it does sound somewhat like the Communications Decency Act case that I mentioned earlier, where banning really just that kind of material was found to be unconstitutional. And still the language of the statute has to be narrowly drawn to accomplish those goals. The attorney for the applicant brought up Cohen v. California, which is the 1971 Supreme Court case that most law students read in law school. Um, involving the arrest of Paul Cohen for wearing a jacket that read, fuck the draft, in the hallway of a California courthouse. And the court found that, the Supreme Court found that his conviction was unconstitutional. There's just so much in this opinion that, um, that speaks to the unconstitutionality of this, this scandalous this prohibition. I'll just read this part here. Surely the state has no right to cleanse public debate to the point where it is grammatically palatable to the most squeamish among us. We think it is largely because governmental officials cannot make principal distinctions in this area that the Constitution leaves matters of taste and style so largely to the individual. Profanity can express a viewpoint and in a way that just can't be replicated without it. It's not the same to say, I disapprove of the draft. Um, I think it's going to be really difficult for the federal circuit to find that the scandalousness bar is constitutional and isn't viewpoint discrimination under Mattel and um, Cohen v. California. So what kinds of marks are we likely to see on the principal register if this part of Section 2A is also struck down, what has the PTO found to be scandalous? And do you think there's a viewpoint expressed by some of these marks? So the USPTO has found that scandalous marks include sexual references, profanity and vulgarity, drug references, and some involving violence. Here are some marks where the applications were rejected. And these were each, I think, importantly, for pornographic websites. The USPTO refused registration for this mark for registration for sorry for restaurant and bar services. These are certainly marks that show some attitude, if not viewpoint. Um, uh, they're for apparel, except but no bullshit is for business consulting services. But these were all rejected. Marks that have 
drug references are often but not always rejected as scandalous. These were rejected because the examiners said they're synonymous with terrorism and terrorist organizations, even though one of them has the word Obama in it, but um, they were found to be scandalous. And these applications were both for apparel. Other marks that allegedly promote violence have been found scandalous. The board found that a substantial portion of the general population of the U.S would find wife beater in connection with t-shirts to be offensive. There's definitely an argument to be made that the scandalousness clause is vague and overbroad. How does the PTO know what the general public will think? Is it going to think marks are vulgar or are they going to think they're funny or a double entendre? What about acronyms like WTF or MILF? What if the audience is looking at porn sites? Are they really going to be scandalized by those terms if that's who the marks are directed to? The Federal Circuit panel in Brunetti said that they had pulled, they said decades, I don't know how this, how this worked out, but decades of marks that had been rejected for being disparaging and marks that had gotten through to registration. And they said that the level of inconsistency in these decisions um, is shocking. And I just have to think that's going to play a part in, in their decision, deciding whether or not to uphold the scandalousness bar. So just in general, I think it's going to be tough to say that this provision is narrowly drawn enough for any interest the government might have in promoting inoffensive language in commerce. So finally, what about dilution by tarnishment? How is that different from the disparagement provision in Mattel? And does the Supreme Court decision put this at risk of being found unconstitutional? The federal statute defines tarnishment as association arising from the similarity between a mark or trade name and a famous mark that harms the reputation of the famous mark. Courts look at this um, usually in two categories, where a trademark is linked to products of shoddy quality or is portrayed in an unwholesome or unsavory context. And almost all these um, cases involve this unwholesome or unsavory context question. But tarnishment sounds an awful lot like disparagement. It's directed at a trademark rather than a person or a group of people. But it does seem to be the same sort of viewpoint discrimination that was criticized in the Mattel case. You, you can't make the mark look bad, but it's okay to give neutral or positive messages about the mark. Um, and it also requires the TTAB or a court to decide, well, what is unwholesome? What's going to offend people? What's going to harm the reputation of the famous mark? There are some provisions in the dilution law that um, really limit the restriction on speech and make the First Amendment a little bit less of a concern here. You can't use a similar mark in connection with identifying and parodying, criticizing, or commenting upon the famous mark owner or the goods or services of the famous mark owner. So you can comment on the trademark owner or the goods or services, but you can't harm the reputation of the trademark itself, which is a pretty subtle distinction. Um, but this is how courts have been dealing with the First Amendment issue in tarnishment cases. They've looked at tarnishment claims just on a case-by-case -case basis, and they've just denied claims that they thought were overreaching into free speech territory. Say there was social commentary, for example. But maybe now a court will start looking at the tarnishment, courts will start looking at the tarnishment provision as a whole um, to decide whether just generally it's viewpoint discrimination. So here's a classic tarnishment case that involves associating famous marks with sex. It's sort of this is a prototypical tarnishment case. 
the website is barbiesplaypen.com and um, I found this the, the, the way back machine. It's always helpful. Um, the court in this case agreed with Mattel that linking Barbie with pornography will adversely color the public's impressions of Barbie. And there was also, there were references to Barbie apparently in, in the website itself, not just the domain name. So it found there was a violation of the federal dilution statute. There are lots of cases that are have this very similar fact pattern. A court found there was tarnishment with an adult entertainment site at candyland.com. There's another case that found tarnishment with a porn site that sort of puzzlingly used the Pottery Barn trademark. Um, these cases seem to be less about expressing an opinion or an emotion and they start seeing a lot more like free riding on a famous trademark. I think if there wasn't a, a tarnishment provision, I mean, these could easily fall under the other dilution provision called blurring, which can stop third parties from using famous marks on um, non-competing products. This is a good example of, of a bad tarnishment decision. The New York Stock Exchange sued over the use of New York slot exchange for a casino. And the Second Circuit found that the casino's mark might tarnish the stock exchange's reputation for integrity, which seems like somewhat of an overreaction. And it looks like really free riding on the mark and not so much hurting its reputation. But here's a, a good tarnishment decision. Louis Vuitton said that these dog toys were likely to tarnish its trademarks because they pose a choking hazard for some dogs. And the Fourth Circuit found this is really just speculation. There's no tarnishment. I think this is more of a parody than a, than a free ride. But in the end, the tarnishment claims might be on, on shaky ground. Dilution doesn't protect consumers because the plaintiff doesn't need to show confusion. The mark owner, it doesn't even have to show actual economic injury. So tarnish might, tarnishment just in the end really might not relate closely enough to the goals of trademark law for a court to be able to overlook the, the viewpoint discrimination that's sort of inherent in it. So overall, looking at the trademark landscape after Mattel, I think it's likely that the bar on registering scandalous marks is going to be struck down. And after that, the only incentive to stop the use of offensive language as trademarks is public opinion. Are lots of people really going to buy Nigga brand plush toys or eggnog or use their charitable fundraising services? I don't think so. Also, people could have been selling those for years just without registration. I think it's pretty telling that they haven't been, at least not in huge numbers. Um, so, and the tarnishment provision not relied on much, but I think it's going to be an uphill battle for, for the next trademark owner who tries to use it. So thank you very much for listening to the presentation. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to, to take them. Thanks, Anne. That was really interesting. We do have a few questions um, here and, uh, and some that have come in from, from participants. Um, one of the questions that have come up is, uh, in addition to the ban on registering disparaging marks and scandalous marks, uh, Section 2A also has a ban on registering deceptive marks. Um, so how does Mattel affect that provision? Yeah, I think that might be the only one left standing in 2A. Um, so deceptive marks are, for example, marks that use the word silk if there's for clothing that doesn't have silk in it. Um, or even the, the mark I had up earlier, marijuana, cola, that drink doesn't actually contain marijuana, so it was found to be deceptive as well as scandalous. Um, so these are trademarks that mislead consumers. I don't, I don't think there's any viewpoint discrimination involved when the PTO rejects those applications, so I don't think there's a problem with deceptive, okay. the deceptive ban. So one of the, one of the things that, you know, we had a, we had a previous uh, session with uh, Simon Tam, mm -hmm. um, who, who also stated that, one of one of his goals was to try to reclaim the term slants uh, um, from its use as a derogatory term. He was trying to he was trying to take that back. Right. So how does how does that play into an argument uh, where you're trying to register your your trademark? I mean, is that sort of intent really relevant in trademark law? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, first of all, I guess I would say that I think it's great that Simon Tam was, was vindicated. I mean, I think this whole thing must have been so difficult for him to bring this all the way to the Supreme Court. And great that he wanted to try to get rid of this derogatory viewpoint from the term. But for purposes of registration and protection, I think the intent is is completely irrelevant. Um, is it used as a source indicator? Is it distinctive? That's really what matters. When people see a trademark, I don't think they're going to look at the intention behind it. They just know when they see the slants on a record, they know they'll like that record because they like the last one and it came from the same band. Um, I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're trying to be funny or, or edgy or silly, I think just for the terms of protection. Or like Eric Brunetti, who's trying to have shock value with putting his his crazy uh, uh, logo, his you know his word mark and the kind of the awful um, design there on kids' clothes. It just matters though how the public sees the mark in commerce. So I don't think that okay. intent like that is relevant. What about other countries? Um, do other countries uh, prohibit registration of uh, scandalous or disparaging trademarks? And is the Mattel decision? Um, I mean, is the decision now really going to put the U.S. out of step with the rest of the world if, if you know, if they're not Oh, lying? definitely. Yes, I definitely think so. We're definitely going to be out of step. There are several countries have laws that deny registration or protection to, to trademarks. They mostly say it's contrary to public policy or public interest or like against principles of morality. They often have the word morality in there. Um, and some of them are include marks for, like offensive to religious principles too. Yes, we are definitely going to be standing out in a way we probably don't really want to be known for. But but yes, this is this is going to make the U.S. Um, unusual in that. Yeah. How about um, here's another question we've just got in. Uh, are are defendants in infringement cases uh, going to have a new First Amendment defense and be able to argue that injunctions are suppressing their freedom of expression? Well, I think they'll. I think they'll certainly try after this case. Um, I mean, on the one hand, there there was a statement in one of the opinions. I think it was the concurrence that said it's it's settled that the law can we can protect consumers if the trademark is confusing. So. I think there was some attempt to sort of forestall that kind of argument, but but there was a lot of suggestion in the opinion that that about trademarks being expressive, and I think that might give the infringement defendants kind of a like a wedge into making a First Amendment argument. Like the court said that trademarks are often catchy phrases that convey a message, but I I mean I don't. I don't know. I don't think these are either very good trademarks or often they're not trademarks at all. They're often these slogans that people put on T-shirts. So, you know, I yeah, I think I think a defendant could maybe use the, the First Amendment defense to kind of muddy the issues a little bit in a in a case after Mattel. I don't I, I don't think it would really work, but I think I think that we're going to see some of that in an upcoming. Yeah, and upcoming opinions. So we had one also uh, question um, from one of the participants on. Uh -huh. um, it looks like it was a, um, a kind of a parody of, uh, of our current President Trump. And how does that, you know, uh, I mean, are there, there going to be First Amendment problems um, with refusing to register? Marks based on lack of consent, you know, putting a, a parody of, of, of the president. I mean, have you even been? I, mean, I guess it's on the political side, right? So right, but that's right. No, that's a really interesting question because there's there's a the 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 Lanham Act says you can't register marks if there's a false suggestion of a connection um, with a with a person, and you need to have their consent. Um, so I think if there's I mean, I don't see how the president would be exempt from that if there's a false suggestion of connection with the president. Were there, there were um, Obama pajamas, I think, 
that was that was rejected during Obama's tenure, Obama pajamas, and uh, and I don't see how it would be any different if there's a mark that even a parody that that um, connects to 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 Trump. Got it. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I mean this viewpoint, but I uh, I'm gonna I would think that. If it says Trump or suggests Trump, whether it's pro or again, you know, for him or against him, I would think that that the PTO would would reject it on that basis. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think that's all the questions that we've got. Great. And Wait, let me. Thanks let me so much that. for your time. Oh yeah. And, uh, Here's and a little contact your, information uh, here. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. It's my adequate website. <laughs> And I spend more time thinking than I do working on my website, but please send me an email if you have any questions. Great. Yeah, if anybody has any questions uh, uh, after this or think of anything else, uh, please uh, email Ann directly or you yeah. can uh, uh, get the information out so we'll get over to Ann. Great. Thanks, everybody, for uh, participating and, uh, and have a great day.